Greetings, my name is Dr. Sherman Quek, and I'm the Cornelius Cardinal Sim Professor of Theology and Dialogue for the Christian Institute for Theological Engagement, or CRISTE. You may obtain more information about CRISTE at www.christe, online, christeonline.org. Each year, the Cornelius Cardinal Sim Professorial Chair awards some research grants to scholars who undertake to research certain crucial topics that benefit the life of the Christian community in some way that is related to theology or ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. The purpose of this podcast is to engage two of our respectable research fellows in conversation regarding an important research project that is currently ongoing. The focus of this research project is how online communications have been instrumental in helping Christians of various persuasions stay connected with the religious activities of their respective faith communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. While this research is now at its tail end, a sequel is being proposed to further understand the reasons that a number of Christians, which includes both Protestants and Catholics in the region of Malaysia and Singapore, are still not returning physically to their respective churches. Let me now introduce our two research fellows before we hear from them. Dr. Pauline Leong is an associate professor with the Department of Communication, School of Arts at Sunway University, Malaysia. She received a PhD from Monash University, Malaysia, and is a research fellow in communication with Chris Day. She has received internal and external grants to pursue her research interests. Dr. Leong was part of a research team that investigated the psychological impact and use of religious coping among Malaysian Catholic older adults during the COVID-19 pandemic. And Dr. Tan Meng Yo is Senior Lecturer of Media and Communication Studies and the Acting Deputy Head of the School of Arts and Social Sciences at Monash University, Malaysia. He completed his PhD with Monash University, Malaysia in 2013 on the subject of online religion, long before COVID-19 put the, the spotlight on this topic. His monograph, Malaysian Christians Online, Faith, Experience and Social Engagement, published in 2020, was on the subject of how Malaysian Christians used online platforms such as blogs and social media sites to express and experience Christian community and spirituality in new ways. More broadly, he has researched and published on how internet practices shape religious and political communication among Malaysians in individual, institutional, and national socio-political contexts. His ongoing curiosity is on the concept of reality in cyberspace and whether spirituality can be experienced online. Well, on a less formal note, I'm sure we prefer to just address one another by name. So a big hi to you, Pauline and Meng Yo. Hello. Thank nice you. To be here. So let's begin this discussion with Meng Yo's research project, which began earlier this year. And the project, as I understand it, is still ongoing. Meng Yo, do let our viewers have an idea of what your current research project is about. And Pauline, of course, do feel free to interact with what Meng Yo shares. Yeah, thanks, Roman. Thanks again for the invitation and opportunity to talk about this. Um, so just to give a little bit of background of what I've been working on, uh, I'm working on a project called The Future of Online Church in Malaysia. It's a project that's uh, funded by, uh, by Chris Day. Uh, quite briefly, the background is really uh, to, uh, you know, the pandemic uh, has led to the Malaysian church or other churches around the world, but I'm talking about Malaysia, uh, to go online for two years. But there, I'm just going to say that when I say go online, it doesn't mean go online in one way. They've gone online in many different ways. Sometimes an institution can go through different iterations of what online services mean. Recorded, Zoom, uh, hybrid, uh, many, many different ways. And, and this, my research project is really to talk to, uh, look at an institutional perspective. So talking to priests, to elders, to deacons, to pastors, leaders of churches, a small cohort of them, to find out the institutional experience of uh, taking the church through the pandemic uh, in an online environment. So although I, I put the word the future of online church, uh, the, the idea is in order to have some prediction about the role of the internet in churches in Malaysia in the future, we need to get a sense of what the present is and what the past is. 
so a lot of it is describing uh, the pastoral experience from, from many different ways, um, looking at the logistics and administration uh, response to a crisis, which is COVID, digital literacy, technology, how these issues are overcome or not overcome. Then, of course, there are also the theological aspects to uh, what online religion means for the churches, both from the Protestant and Catholic point of views. Um, you, you find there's a spectrum of views there. Uh, what are the different tools that's been used and, and from, from describing this environment as much as I can from the institutional perspective, we can get a sense of what are some practices or principles that can be carried over into a post-COVID society whenever that actually happens, whenever when we actually label it's a post-COVID society. So yeah, that's basically it, it's an institutional perspective. I'm at the tail end, it's, most, it's interviews. Uh, I'm at the tail end of doing my interviews and I'm also coding uh, and starting to analyze the data is really interesting so far, but yeah. Pauline, do you have any response or questions to Ming Yu about this? I think it's a very interesting project. In fact, um, uh, it's something that I also thought, thought about um, uh, when it comes to, you know, church, can it be actually online? And the difficulties, you know, in, in transitioning from uh, uh, an offline world, you know, that we used to use, used to be in, and in moving to online, it was not easy. And I'm pretty sure I'm quite interested in finding out about Ming, uh, Ming Yu's findings when it's ready, you know, especially from the uh, from the church leadership, how they manage to uh, make the transition. Because I'm seeing it from a layman's, uh, the latest perspective. So I have no idea how the church leaders actually uh, went through that uh, that experience. So it'll be a very interesting uh, study that will come out. I'm looking forward to the findings. Yeah. Um, I, I At this point, I, I, I don't want to give any findings because I'm not sure. I'm in the middle of coding, but just some brief uh, preview to some of the things I've observed just by talking to people. They're actually, it's a very nuanced topic. Uh, it, it, we want to come to some kind of generalization at the end of it, sure. Uh, but but I, I've also learned things just by talking to the different leaders, right? Uh, that I never anticipated to begin with. Like, for example, I, I think not a lot of people think about how the pastoral ministry has changed, uh, how they've looked at, how, how some of these leaders look at their own ministry has changed. Their congregation has changed without them seeing them for two years. They've, they've come back to church and they're realizing that they have changed. You know, not a lot of people talk about that. Um, demographically as well, I found it very interesting uh, that a number of people talked about how uh, actually, it's not so much the older folk that had trouble. Uh, it's actually the younger demographic that had issues transitioning to online services and there are reasons why. Uh, so they actually, it's actually a very nuanced topic that varies from state to state, from locality to locality. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we can learn a lot from the different experiences from different people. There are some universal experiences, for example, okay, crisis mode and all that. But there are these little nuances that I think we can help us learn and empathize with the ministry as well. Yeah, yeah it, it's very interesting to, uh, and, and um, very appetizing actually to, um, to anticipate what might come out of uh, the interviews that you have conducted. But um, I'm also actually very curious, uh, even now, although my question may be a bit premature, lah, but um, I understand that your interviews were conducted uh, with both uh, Protestant church leaders as well as Catholic church leaders. So um, could you give us a little bit of an idea of how the responses might be similar or somewhat different um, between the leaders of these two uh, groups of communities? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I no think need, No need for anything too conclusive. Yeah, so, so generally it. speaking, yeah, generally speaking, I think the, the, there are universal similarities. Mm. Uh like the struggle to engage with a community that's no longer present physically. Right? I think that one is universal. Uh, and both uh, both uh, the, the Protestant leaders and the Catholic leaders uh, have different, have the same scale spectrum of success and failures. Some succeeded in engaging the people, some not so successful. They resorted to similar tools uh, like Zoom, WhatsApp, uh, some lost contact. So you have varying degrees of success, and this is true for, for both. Um, one similarity, which I can say for sure, and I don't think this is particularly surprising, um, is, is they've, they've learned that actually online tools are quite good for administrative purposes in the church. Uh, 
it, it lends to a certain efficiency that they've never experienced before in a certain way. Uh, so like meetings and all that. Uh, online giving, for example, came up a few times, a new way of uh, easing these transactions. Uh, and also they from a from a community point of view, they found it's quite useful in uh, in training, for example. Uh, a lot of them talked about this. So these are shared across uh, the board. Uh, uh, an expanded audience is also quite common uh, where they have people dropping in from different uh, parts of the world even to, to check out the different services, what goes on. So these are shared. Uh, the struggles are similar. Uh, the differences would be most stuck in uh, the uh, spiritual well, the spiritual aspects of an online service. Uh, that one you, you see a little bit of difference in opinion. Like for example, and I think this might come up a little bit in our discussion today. For example, things like uh, things like communion, the Eucharist, for example. Uh, there are different views of uh, whether whether doing this online in your homes. Uh, how how do we interpret this or discuss this spiritually and theologically? There are differing views. Um, even ideas of a community is it necessary for them to gather in a building or is a virtual gathering? A legitimate gathering. So all these centers around, uh, from, from a media studies point of view, centers around the term of authenticity. What is an authentic experience uh, and materiality? Uh, what is the role of material religion in a virtual setting? So we get a diversity of views here. Uh, yeah, quite, quite diverse. It'll take me a whole hour to go through them, but enough for now. Yeah, thank you. So yeah. basically, the, 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 the community's theology of worship and the sacraments and devotions yeah. affects uh, how far it perceives it can go in terms of its use of online means. Yeah. 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 Can, can I share um, a study that I did, you know, and we looked at older uh, adults, uh, older Catholics, you know, those that were 60 and above and how they transition. Because the focus of that study, uh, which was published in a book chapter, was to, you know, we assume that the younger people had easier time to adjust, you know, to the online world. So we focus on the older, older people. And yes, I agree with you, the concept of materiality, you know, and authenticity came up very strongly amongst the, the older Catholics because um, uh, all of them, you know, grew up in a world where, you know, you have to receive communion. There, there must be something there, you know, it must be physical. You have to be physically in church. You must be physically receiving commun communion. And so when the, uh, when the pandemic happened and everything was online, and they really felt a sense of loss. You know, where is my faith? You know, uh, I, if I don't go to church weekly, I some of them even go to church daily, you know, you know, receive communion daily. And when they don't have that during the pandemic, it was really a sense of a shock to the system. They felt really, really lost. So for the first few months, a lot of them experienced, you know, uh, truly a shock to the, to the system. And um, But slowly they adjusted with the help of the their children, you know, um, or their grandchildren, you know, and, and then they found that, um, they started exploring a lot of things online which they never explored before. They found uh, like old movies about the, the faith. They, they actually attended, uh, you know, could go to the Vatican and attend Holy Week's uh, mass and services and all that. So it expanded their world and they were, you know, uh, found various new means of expressing their faith. So, well, of course, for them, nothing beats going back to mm. church, but let's put it this way. But um, um, it was uh, a way of exploring new aspects and, and I'm glad the, the respondents in our interviews uh, managed to do that. And in fact, they felt that it, it, it sort of like um, made them more empathetic to people who couldn't receive, who couldn't go for mass, you know, right? So they, it brought a different aspect of their faith during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is excellent information for us to learn. Um, so we have noted that Meng Yu's research, the current one that's ongoing, is more focused on the endeavors of the leaders of various Christian communities to reach out to their people. And uh, now based on what Pauline uh, is sharing, the conversation has been brought further, it seems, uh, uh, for us to focus a bit more on the experience of the grassroots laity in terms of the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic to their faith nourishment and their faith expression. So I think the conversation has more or less quite naturally led to that now. Uh, from a, a, a research on uh, the, the efforts of the church leaders now to church members at the grassroots and what their experience is in terms of um, online use and um, um, the benefits that they derive from, from the um, online media uh, in terms of their, their spiritual activity, nourishment, their spiritual expression. So let's keep this conversation uh, 
moving towards that direction. So um, how do you think the church laity have reacted to the lockdowns during the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of their faith? Okay, I think that it was necessary for the health authorities to contain the, um, the virus because um, there was a lot of transmissions and uh, the church authorities being responsible shepherds of the flock, you know, as well as law-abiding citizens, you know, they followed the health directives as they didn't want the members of the laity to be infected by the virus, which had then at the time caused deaths by millions around the world. But that also affected the faith of the Christians who, like I said earlier, could not physically, you know, fulfill their uh, Sunday obligations. So like what Menyo said earlier, you know, uh, churches uh, pivoted towards online services, you know, streaming of uh, liturgical, you know, masses as well as praise and worship services. And yeah, um, a lot of people, you know, uh, had a lot of confusion and loss because they were not used to praying through a digital medium. So for the first time in history, they were only, they could only follow you know, um, uh, mass or, or praise and worship through uh, the medium of the internet. And, um, and there was also a loss of community because um, in, in my interviews with the older Christ, uh, Catholics, you know, they, they had used their rosary sessions together. They would gather together, you know, and pray physically in people's houses, each other's houses. And now they could not do so. And Zoom, uh, you know, was not a good substitute. It was uh, an alternative, but it was not a good substitute for them. But like I said, a lot of them, you know, started, you know, adjusting. And in fact, I had one person who um, uh, actually, you know, conducted alpha courses online. You know, he learned <laughs> how to conduct it online. So they really uh, adjusted, you know, and in fact, they started exploring, you know, all over the world, the masses. And they also created their own online communities, you know, uh, instead of being stuck all at home. Right. So that was, uh, for me, an, an interesting observation of what happened then. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will add on to what Pauline is saying uh, with a little preface to say that I don't know for sure. Uh, I mean, I have my own experience. I can look around me a little bit, but I don't know for sure. And I think it's something that we have to explore uh, because it's, it's easy to come up with some one size fit all uh, answer. We probably can have a few good guesses, uh, but it's definitely something that we, we should talk to people and find out more uh, to validate some of the things that are uh, Pauline talked about. Um, I, I'll, I'll ask a couple, I'll, I'll frame this in a, as a couple of additional questions, things that we can think about uh, about the lady's experience. Uh, so, so the first thing that I, I, I'd be curious about is uh, why do they bother to go to an online church in the first place? So like when, when lockdown was coming soon or when it's announced, uh, first, the first question I'd be interested in is were people actually looking forward to uh, some kind of online uh, service were they expecting the church to do something and if the answer is yes uh, why that would that, be the question what about the church did they want so desperately to hold on to knowing that the physical service is taken away from them uh, you know uh, what would what would people's reasons be to engage with online church because during the lockdown remember everything was shut down in a lot of cases even work was shut down uh, but what why is it from the Christian's perspective for a lot of these church members, why was it important for them to find some way to carry on with this? Is it about uh, engaging with the presence of God? Is it about uh, finding a way to engage with a community that means so much to them? Uh, what are they, basically, what are they most desperate to keep hold of? Uh, that's, that's one. And related to that, of course, is if they don't actually look forward to an online service, why not? So there are people who never bothered for the last two, three years. Why not? Uh, is it a case of them realizing that uh, it didn't really matter to them? Or maybe there are reasons that they just never felt online service would cut it? There are all kinds of reasons, all right? So, so I, I framed, asked that first question, why, do why did people want to go to an online church in the first place? Uh, related to that, let's say they do go for online churches. I'd be curious to know uh, which aspects of online church work, what models work. There's so many different ways of doing it. And, and, and I think we're going to get some interesting answers here because from, from what I hear from different people is a lot of people took the chance to visit other churches during this time as well. Uh, they, there are also people who changed membership during this time. That's another story. So why did they do that? Uh, did they, uh, certain, because certainly church is not limited to your local church. Church is now global. You can technically visit churches anywhere in the world and participate actively. 
I won't even go there today, but I think Sherman knows I'm a bit interested in a virtual reality church. Yeah, even people who go to these places to attend church, they started exploring these spaces. So which model worked? Uh, like, for example, just to jump back to my own work, there, there, were, there were leaders who told me that their cell groups worked out very well. That's my experience personally as well. Cell group was very, very important to me during COVID-19. It was the most important aspect of my church experience during this time because it's what kept the community very close to me sharing each other's struggles. But there were others who, whose cell groups completely disappeared. Uh, people didn't find that a necessary part of the experience. Uh, so a lot of different nuances. And all of this leads to us thinking about the future. What, what, what do church, and this one probably in your next area of discussion, uh, what, what do church members uh, think about the future and the role of technology, modern technology in spirituality in church? Yeah, so these are some of my curiosities peppered with some of my observations. Yeah, like, yeah, a lot of interesting things. And in addition to that, I'm also quite, I would be also quite curious to know if uh, perhaps uh, people who have found uh, um, an interest or an attraction in the online space in terms of their religious participation mm -hmm. in church services and masses and all this, uh, could it be because of the kind of anonymity that they get to keep when they participate in these services online. Um, that would be something interesting to find out mm. as well. I think that would definitely be true for some, maybe not all, but definitely for some. I can think of some personality types who would be, like you already try to be anonymous when you go to church physically, and this just amplifies that that, yeah. that, that potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely. just want to come and worship, but stay away from me. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, based on my experience in that research that I did previously, um, the older Catholics felt that online mass didn't cut it for them because they were more of spectators mm. rather than participants. You know, when you go to a mass, you know, you pray also with your body, you stand up, sit down, you kneel, etc. You participate fully in person. So for them, that was a very important experience of worship, you know, in mass. And when you are in uh, at home, you get distractions. Number one, you know, when you're having mass, there'll be a doorbell ringing, a dog is barking. You know, mm -hmm. so all that distracted them and they felt it just didn't, you know, it didn't bring that in, enough spirituality during that period. So some of them actually, you know, they tried to follow, you know, sit down, stand up and all that. But, you know, in at home, but it was just not there, the whole experience of it, because we are not praying as a community for mm -hmm. them. You mm -hmm. know, going to church, it means that they meet their friends, you know, they, they meet the same people they meet with, you know, at mass. So that was important, praying as a community. So going online uh, was not for them. Yeah. So right now we are we are actually proposing to bring uh, this research forward uh, from just uh, getting the views and the feedback of of uh, the leaders of various Christian communities, Catholic and Protestant Christian communities, to now uh, listening to the experiences of the people at the grassroots now. Uh, mm -hmm. So I and I think that it's it's very opportune in the sense of uh, well providentially you know Pauline you represent the the Catholic uh, side of, of the research. And uh, Ming Yo, you come from an evangelical Protestant background. So uh, it's, it's very opportune because it provides for a very balanced uh, 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 way of uh, presenting your findings, uh, not just getting, um, getting information and data, but also eventually presenting your findings from this proposed research. Uh. So I think that that is very opportune. Uh. Do you think that that might actually have any kind of bearing on the research, um, the fact that both of you come from different Christian backgrounds. Well, I think the, the good thing is that we were both friends and we're doing our PhD, so we know each other pretty well. So that would help certainly help in the collaboration. And I think there is also, uh, we are actually learning from each other you know, from our different faiths. So I think that really helps, you know. So, um, you know, while Ming Yo can... Uh, 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 we'll learn more about, you know, the Catholic way of worship. And I'm also learning from Mingyu as well, you know, the, the Protestant, you know, uh, Christian way of, of doing things. So I think that there is a lot of synergy here and I'm really happy to be working with him on uh, on this project. Yeah. And Mingyu, yeah. based on your current research, right, have you, and, and in your interviews with with a non, uh, with non with Catholic leaders uh, rather than the... Mm -hmm and the non-Catholic leaders, right? Have you discovered anything shocking or that jumps out at you or something? Uh, like sh shocking, no. La. I mean, it's it's not like I've been completely clueless about uh, the differences. 
uh, but but one but but I definitely learned a lot. Um, it's not so much shocking in that uh, in that you know, in that the Catholic Church, for example, believes in something completely different doctrinally or anything like that. Not 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 nothing like that. It's one one thing I've learned, and I've so this is where you learn personally through research as well. Uh, is that I I learned that the different understandings of uh, different uh, different things like, like for example I'll, I'll go straight to the one where there's a biggest difference okay on, on Eucharist for example right uh, the, the whole communion it's not so much what what struck me is not so much about uh, whether you need to be in church to receive it or not or whether it's a symbolic thing I mean that debate is interesting but it wasn't what interested me what interested me and where I learned a lot was uh, how uh, the Catholic Church views their relationship with Christ in that process. I think that's something I've never really spent a lot of time thinking about before. And just doing, just by interacting with these people, uh, you get you get a, a picture of this. I mean, these are not things that people necessarily write in books to describe as part of the process. But you actually learn uh, not just the theological aspects of why why people believe in different things, but it translates to how they view God as well and how they experience God. And I learned a lot. And of course, there are many technical things that I never picked up before, which I learned. But going back to your earlier question, though, uh, about uh, whether there will be a difference between these two communities, uh, there will be differences, I think, but there will also be sim a lot of similarities. Um, the, the differences may not necessarily come down to Protestant Catholic difference. It could be difference in other factors like age, education, so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. And also how our communities actually uh, function sociologically. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So bringing this conversation further, uh, what are your observations uh, since the churches started opening their doors in terms of uh, people attending masses in the Catholic Church and services in the Protestant churches? Uh, Polly, you want to go first, or I can go first. Uh, you can ask Protestant churches. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> both, both, both. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you I can go first if you want. Yeah. Uh. Okay. No. No. I mean, I was. I was okay. So I'll, I'll. I'll just say a few words. Um. From from my observation, the the return is gradual. A little bit like how the loosening of the MCOs over time has been gradual. The return to church has also been gradual. I don't know whether it's on par or not. Maybe there's something we can look at. Uh, but some are very enthusiastic to come back. The moment there's a small chance you could be in church, the person is there. Uh, then there are those who are very cautious for health reasons and all of that. Then there are also those, and this one you hear a lot from the pulpit, uh, people who don't want to come back because they just refuse to. Uh, they can go to work, they can go to shopping malls, they can go out with their friends, but somehow church is a... Uh, it's a crowded place and, and you can't come. So, so there's that element of that. Uh, but but beyond all these like all these reasons that we can think of, again, I'd like to ask a couple of questions that we can be uh, we can find out more. The first question I ask is actually after these two three years, we have to answer the question: Has the church changed? Uh, and we have to be very honest with this question uh, from every different perspective possible. Uh, for example, change as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. True, true. Because of the pandemic and because of two years of very intense mm. uh, training in terms of digital and technical literacy, a lot of intense community building via online. I'm not saying we're going to stay there forever, but it's definitely left a mark. Okay, uh, has the church changed, and what are these changes? Uh, has has the idea of membership changed amongst people? Has ideas have ideas of authority changed among the people? Uh, sources of uh, religious knowledge has that have those views changed? Mm. Uh, how people experience spirituality has that changed? For example, I I had people I've heard of people who came to know the Lord through online sharing of gospel and online, and and they came to know uh, they came to accept Jesus during an online service, you know. It's very hard to say that it's not valid in some form. There's some kind of spiritual transaction that took place for them to come to that kind of conviction. Mm -hmm. uh, where do we factor this into the church experience going forward? So I think when we can put some words down to how the church in Malaysia has changed, then we can start to think about uh, how the community will adapt to the church going forward. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of thoughts. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, before I say too much, I'll pass it to Pauline. 
actually, um, we, you know, what you have said actually also resonated with me because I had the same thoughts as well, although I didn't articulate to you at that point in time. Yeah, I, I also felt, you know, that uh, when uh, church uh, reopened physically, you know, I was one of the few like, oh, we were great, you know, I can go back and I don't have to worry about registering, etc. And it was much easier. And um, I guess I was one of the diehard ones that were the first back. And I could see, you know, the same people that I met, you know, during uh, the masters, they were there, you know, and uh, and some of these people were probably the ones who have, were adjusting to the, who had problems adjusting to the on online environment and felt really lost. So going back to mass, you know, physically in church was, you know, something that was, you know, uh, so important to them. And uh, they were, and for, especially for Catholics, you know, the materiality, you know, the, the sacraments, you know, they were actually able to receive you know, the body and blood of Christ physically, you know. So for them, right, spiritual communion, while it was, you know, there, was not good enough for them. So uh, being able to receive it physically was the, the, the key factor in going back to Mass. And also the second thing was that the sacrament of reconciliation, you know, was suspended during the pandemic. So they couldn't go for confession. And, and, um, and so therefore, going back to Mass meant being able to receive the sacraments, and that was very important. And this group of people enthusiastically went back to physical Mass because there's uh, some sense of normalcy again in the religious life. But um, going, uh, seeing, uh, for me, going back to Mars, but I'm seeing that attendance is, did not reach the same level of the pre-pandemic attendance, you know. Yes, you know, slowly people are coming back. But like, it's, like you say, Mingyu, you know, there were some people, you know, they say, oh, it's too, still unsafe to go back to church, you know. But I do see them at restaurants. I do see them at shopping malls, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself that, you know, church isn't it safer because we have a lot more SOPs than restaurants and malls. But yet, for them, you know, the church is unsafe. So for me, that, that was a question mark, you know. And so therefore, you know, I am interested in finding out why is it that, you know, pastors are not as packed as before? What's the reason? You know, possibly it's because, you know, for the Catholic Church, we have not, I don't think there's a dispensation yet. So which means that Catholics still are allowed to attend online mass in fulfillment of the Sunday obligation. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm curious to see, you know, um, uh, what's the reason for them to continue fulfilling their religious obligations and devotions to the online medium? And like what you mentioned, you know, there could be a change in membership. I'm also interested, have there been dropouts? Have people actually left the church to move on mm -hmm. to another church or left the church completely because, you know, they just felt that there was no connection at all. So um, I think there's a lot of questions that we need to find out. What's the church now? You know, like you say, what's the changes I wouldn't say it's post-pandemic. I would say in this recovery phase, mm. I think the church is also recovering from the yeah, pandemic. Right. How do we yeah. assess the recovery, you know? Uh, the church as well as the people, you know, recovering from this. What do you suspect the result of your findings would be? <laughs> I don't want to speculate. <laughs> Just like I don't want to speculate on any election results. <laughs> it's the same thing. As researchers, we rely on data, right, Minyo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we okay. can point to the areas that we'll look at. Uh, I mean, but but it's very hard to say. Yeah. I mean, we probably can come up with a, you know, a few different hypotheses on what we think we might find. But I think that, I mean, even just looking at, just hearing what Pauline said, we can even like dig down further, you know, different churches have different SOPs, right? Different churches have different levels of enforcement of SOPs. So even if we ignore the bits about people refusing to come back because of invalid reasons, let's look at the valid reasons. Uh, maybe there's something there. Different churches treat the pandemic differently and maybe that is a cause for concern. So you see, I mean, someone might, there, there might be people who say things like that that we don't expect. So I think I think we can be quite open to see what people say. But the important thing is to not discount any possibilities at the moment. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this proposed uh, research project uh, that uh, mm -hmm. both of you are going to embark on as a sequel to Meng Yeo's um, earlier or an ongoing uh, current research, what is the aim of this project? Okay. So the aim of this project is actually to examine the reasons why some Christians, you know, Protestants as well as Catholics, who have gone back to physically praying in church and also to talk to those who prefer to do it online. What what is the reason for the, for them, you know, the, for their preferences? And also, we would like to talk to some who have actually even left church completely. What was the reason? Basically, the aim is to, you know, examine, you know, their lived experience during this period and the consequences of their experience, you know, now, you know, in the uh, during the recovery phase. And we intend to conduct this research, you know, on the laity in two countries, Malaysia and Singapore, as both countries experienced the pandemic lockdowns around the same time. 
And I think that this research is important and significant to understand the possible attitudes, perceptions, and behavior of Malaysian and Singaporean Christians as uh, we emerge from the two-year crisis. Yeah. So, yeah. No, go on. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so the objectives of this research is to investigate the reasons why they have gone back and why they have not gone back, you know, and also um, with the findings, right, perhaps propose su uh, possible suggestions on how um, church leaders can undertake to revitalize the faith of their followers to bring them back into the fold, right? So what we intend to do is to use um, semi-structured interviews. We collect, we talk to uh, a sample of Catholic and Protestant Christians in Malaysia and Singapore. So this will be a pilot study and because we want to examine the issue in depth uh, and, uh, and we I will interview participants who are from Male, who are males and females from different age groups and from two different countries. Ming Yu, anything else to add? Yeah, so uh, just a big, just a big picture uh, uh, comment. In, in addition to that, uh, if I can just just park this in a slightly media, you know, media centric comment. Uh, one of the realities that we are facing now is uh, it has been a reality for a while, but more apparent now is that we live in what we what academics call a mediatized society, meaning to say that every element of our, every aspect of our life has in some way been touched by media, not necessarily like full blown like screen, but some bits of knowledge have come from the media. We've learned something from the media. Uh, of course, there are, there are in the context of religion, there are some who view that the media has. Uh, taken over the role of the church as the primary disseminators of knowledge uh, in, in amongst certain communities. That's, uh, that's one of like, if you take it all the way to the end, but basically our views, our experiences of, uh, of Christianity has been touched by media. I mean, if you want to go far back to printing press, obviously uh, we can start from there, but we're just talking about today, like our sources of knowledge, of ideas of authority, even our, even our knowledge of doctrine, community with social media and all that a lot of our whether or not whether or not we come back to the church physically or not the reality is uh, we live in a mediatized society and our religion is touched by media in some way mm -hmm. now so so in a slightly philosophical sense uh we want i want to see how uh how people understand the role and relationship between modern media communications and technologies interacts with with a, with a faith that's quite old you know yeah with a faith that's quite old and how this is this results in different interpretations of why we go to church physically or online so this is just to give it some theoretical grounding where i'm coming from yeah media is a part of it we just want to understand that relationship a lot more deeply yeah uh, are both of you aware of any other scholar or institution in malaysia or singapore that have been embarking on a research of similar nature? And if yes, how far have they gone in terms of their findings? Yeah, uh, there's a document I sent around. I think uh, there's some institutions in Singapore that did a survey on, um, a big picture survey uh, on folks in Christians in Singapore and uh, why they go back to church and why they don't. Uh, it's a survey. Where we're hoping to come in is to uh, pair it with uh, the qualitative aspect to it. And I think that's so is quantitative, isn't it? Yeah, this is quantitative. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. It, it will be very complementary then what mm. you are proposing mm. to do. Okay. Right. Well, as a survey, will give you a big picture, yeah. right? And I think that's only from Singapore. So from Malaysia, I'm not sure whether there's any uh, thing that's being done. Um, I, I may not be aware of, but. Um, I think it would be good to go in depth and, and um, exploit a, in a qualitative manner because mm. that will give you richer data, you know, uh, from the experiences of uh, uh, the lady ground, ground up, you know. Yeah, so, the nuances. Uh, like, like, yes. Anything that has been published in Malaysia so far? Like. Uh, published, I'm not sure. Not, Other not than on the uh, academic level, I think. Academic yeah. level, only the one yeah. that I did on the, the book, on uh, the book yeah. chapter, but that was yeah. only on a small target group of uh, older older mm. Catholics above 60, mm. you know, and that was only during the pandemic mm. phase. So now as we emerge, um, I think that's timely that, you know, we examine the church, you know, and the laity uh, at this stage of recovery, you know, as we, you know, move towards 
you know, some, some sense of normalcy. The virus is still around us, that's the thing. You know, so we can't be 100% normal. So how are people coping right now? You know, is we are actually in, in between phase, you know. Mm. Yeah. Mm. How, uh, what, what's the timeline of this project like in terms of duration? How long do you think it will take before you can complete the research and come up with something conclusive? Mm, I think we'll probably need about um, uh, a year, right? For the first few months, we would be actually uh, doing the literature review, um, searching for the, the literature that was uh, published, you know, um, uh, on this topic and looking at the theoretical framework. And then after that, we'll be, we will need at least uh, three months or so to complete the interviews because we'll be doing at least, if I'm not mistaken, we're doing at least 30, 32. So there's quite a number of people. And there's also transcriptions needed. And then after that, uh, Mingyu and I will need to actually do the, the data um, uh, analysis you know, and so we will need actually about a year to actually come up with at least initial findings from our research. And what concretely do you hope that this project will achieve? Okay. Well, we hope that this study will provide insights into the attitudes, perceptions and behaviours and it will reveal the reasons why, you know, people are coming back to church, uh, people are not coming back and like, like what Mingyu said, you know, what is the concept of church? What's the idea of church? You know, and is church really necessary for them in their faith? You know, so it's it's to, it's a total, uh, and it could be a, a game changer, right? Because you know, um, how and and how would, um, the church leaders respond to this, mm. right? Because a church is not is it's it's take two hand to clap. You know, you have the church leaders and you have the flock, mm. so we both must understand each other as well. So I hope that this the findings of this would actually assist church leaders, you know, the shepherds of the church to you know engage you know with the flock and to enrich their faith experience. Mm. So in a sense, Mingyu's current ongoing research uh, among church leaders, and then this one that you're proposing as a sequel to Mingyu's research uh, among the lay, the, the, the lay grassroots Christians, is like um, actually initiating a dialogue between the two parties in our Christian communities. Wouldn't you say that? Yeah, it could be, definitely. Yeah, right. I, I, I imagine there will be a strong overlap between the kind of things that uh, the leaders thought of and what the, uh, what the laity uh, thinks of in terms of what they felt worked, didn't work, how they perceive the future, uh, there'd be similarities and differences. And, and it'd be good to identify what the similarities and differences are, because otherwise how do you go forward, right? Like what Pauline says, you know, if, it's a, if it's completely mismatched expectations and strategies uh, and understanding of the faith, uh, faith community, uh, it's not going to end well, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's it, in a way it's also a kind of a a test on uh to discover how well the leaders of Christian communities have come to understand the struggles of their people during this pandemic. Yeah, whether they have heard their struggles correctly or not. Mm. Yeah, but but I want to I just want to put a little disclaimer that 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 when I'm not. I don't think our project is in any way out to cause dissent in any way. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it can be interpreted that way or hearing what the people say, is it different from what leaders say? Uh, but I think both of us come from communications background uh, and that, that's really what we're trying to look at. We want to look at these communication channels over time and, what, and going forward, how effective has, has always been in a formal and informal level, uh, creating new opportunities for dialogue going forward. You know, so, so it's just a network of communication processes that we can evaluate and see how we can improve on it or keep up doing what's working. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree with Mingyo. You know, um, we are a communication scholar, so definitely communication is a two-way, two-way street yeah. in that sense. Yeah. So I think the only way to actually achieve greater understanding is to listen as well. You know, to um, you know what, what we're giving is the information, but you know, we're also listening to people, you know, giving them a voice from the ground. So that you know, um, they, the the lady had their voice heard as well. You know, in terms of their lived experience during the pandemic, and that's what we hope to uh, and that our research will provide greater understanding between the the shepherds and their flock. That's mm -hmm. the aim. Mm -hmm. uh, in the fifty six World Communication Day, right, the Pope did say that um, we should listen with the ear of the heart, and that's what I hope this research will be. That um, the the lady as well as the the shepherds of the flock, the church leaders, will listen to each other. And not just listen with the words, but also listen with the heart. And with the heart, 
we can provide greater understanding uh, amongst both, uh, both parties. Yeah, it truly sounds to me like this research project will yield some significant findings that will probably help the leaders of Christian communities to understand the minds of the people better. Uh, of course, it also takes um, a resolute listening la, on the part of those of us who are leading our Christian communities. And uh, this does include myself because I'm a, I'm a leader in the Catholic community. So hopefully this will truly help Christian leaders to be more aware of how we can more effectively reach out to people, uh, particularly those who have not yet returned to their worshipping communities in a more physical way. So thank you so much, Pauline and Mengyo, for having this conversation with me and with each other. And I very much look forward to a fruitful and exciting journey with the both of you as you embark on this research together. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah.